everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 90, folks. 90 of them of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, folks, we're going to be kicking it back, enjoying life, living the dream 100. We're going to talk about wrist pain. What do you do if you are weight-bearing? Maybe it's in a push-up, maybe it's in quadruped position, or maybe it's something else wild and crazy that you're weight-bearing during. What do you do if your wrist is bothering you? I'll give you the answer. We're going to talk about poke, poke, dry needling, and psh, psh, taping. Are these useful modalities? Are they worthwhile? Ooh, it's a little bit of a polarizing topic, but what do I think? I'll give you the answers. And last but not least, should I become a PT? By I, you mean you. Do you, or should you, I should say, become a physical therapy physical therapist? Should you pursue the physical therapy career? These are the questions that have been asked by the people, and they will be answered for the people by this people right here, fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Alex, and here's Alex's question. I've had a string of clients recently who have wrist pain or discomfort when on all fours or in a push-up position. Is this likely related to the shitty pump handle mechanics and movement limitations at the shoulder? What would be your approach to be, or what would your approach be to improving comfort in this position? Alex, this is a great question. Wrist pain or discomfort. So I think there are pretty much, uh, it can be boiled down to two key issues um, in regards to why one might have wrist pain when they are weight-bearing. The first is either they're putting too much weight through the extremity because they can't attain rib cage positioning. That's one. The second thing could be that they have wrist extension limitations, and that's just putting some funky compression through the wrist. So let's unpack that one step at a time. First thing, rib cage. You can't keep the rib cage drop. You can't stack the lower thorax atop the pelvis. Here's what's going on. If I'm in the quadruped position and I let my thorax move forward, whether it's through retracting the shoulder blades or whether it's through losing the, the lower thorax positioning, keeping the zone of apposition. If you don't know what that is for crying out loud, I'll link it in the show notes. But let's say you can't do that. Then what's going to happen is instead of evenly distributing the workload throughout the entire extremity, what you're going to do is put more pressure through the arms. Wrist takes the brunt of the beating through that. We got problems. A few solutions to that. One, maybe you got to pick an easier exercise so they can establish lower thorax orientation. So instead of going with arms straight, if you're doing uh, maybe a push-up variation, maybe you want to start with uh, a quadruped on elbows positioning instead. Or maybe you're doing quadruped. Go to quadruped on elbows, have them reach through that, see if they can achieve the lower thorax orientation that we're desiring, where they can achieve a full exhalation so they keep appropriate abdominal tension then maybe you're going to come back to that a bit later and see if they can um, tolerate the positioning without having too much issues on their wrist. More often than not, that is the problem, and that can be an easy solution. If it's a push-up position, maybe that's just too much weight to be uh, maintaining the thorax positioning, and they fall forward on that. Easy fix. You can either utilize an incline push-up variation, or I really like the push-up variations that Coach Bo, Michelle Bolin, I'll link her in the show notes, uh, showed me, which are bear push-ups, which are basically like quadruped push-ups. So what you would do is you would set up with, instead of the knees extended, knees flexed, you might be able to get a little bit better tuck and a little bit better reach in that position. Many times that can fix some of the wrist discomfort that you have. And I'll link a bear push-up in the show notes as well, because I like them. So those would be some simple fixes. One, regress the position. Two, maybe they do pretty well, but they're still getting some wrist discomfort. You got a couple options here. In the short term, easy fix would be to go to fists. So that way you're not taking an interminal wrist extension. 
a lot of times that solves the issue of wrist pain with uh, quadruped or weight bearing activities. But maybe you want to get that wrist straight. I would check to see if they have wrist extension. Perhaps they have a wrist extension limitation, which if they do, then it probably makes sense that, well, if you're putting weight through the arms and you can't achieve full extension, well, it's probably going to be uh, stressful to that region. So you want to do things to improve upon your wrist mobility. What would you do? Ah, nothing just yet, because you got to go upstairs first. Make sure that they've established the ability to put air into all directions in the upper thorax, so you got some good shoulder range of motion. And then what it really boils down to is do they have full elbow range of motion? Do they have supination, pronation, extension, flexion? If they are lacking range of motion in one of those directions, that's going to influence the orientation that happens at the wrist. For example, as I pronate my arm, that's going to um, allow me to also, that's going to go with concomitant wrist flexion and ulnar deviation. And then supination, I'm going to have some wrist extension and radial deviation. If I have a limitation in my ability to supinate, well, that could possibly impact wrist extension. Or maybe I have elbow hyperextension. That could also impact wrist extension because then I'm not getting as much elbow flexion as I ought to be able to. So the solution for that might be improving those ranges of motion. Things I like, if you have someone who's got elbow hyperextension, bicep curls are great variations to use. If you got someone with a supination lim limitation, you're probably going to put them in a degree of supination. And that may restore wrist extension secondary to taking into account elbow orientation. But the, the, the crux of what to do with elbows, and I got debriefs talking about that. Um, yeah, elbow debriefs, um, which I would dive into on the show notes, which will be on zackcouples.com either tonight or tomorrow. But the, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you put the humerus in the orientation that it can't get into. And so, for example, if I have a ton of supination, that means the, the humerus is in an internal rotated, inter, internally rotated position. Like, as in, I've seen a lot of people where they have excessive supination. And if they have that, then they probably have too much IR at the humerus. And then what you would want to do is ER the humerus. Vice versa. You have someone who's got pronation beyond established norms. Then that person may have an externally rotated humerus and then you'll want to put them in IR. For example, in myself, I have supination limitations. I have tons of external rotation at the shoulder. In order to improve my elbow mobility, I would program a bicep curl in the concentrated position or with the wrist neutral. That way I'm internally rotating the humerus and then also having subsequent normal orientation of the forearm with the, the wrist neutral position. That would be an example of how to break down what to, to look for in that regard. But the rule of thumb, and I teach this at my seminars, human matrix, is you want to put people into the positions that they can't get into or as close to that end range as possible and make them suffer. So you can drum up any variations you want. If you've done that and you still have a wrist extension limitation, which is quite rare, then you're probably going to be doing some wrist extension-based stretches. The classic arm straight, pulling the, uh, the wrist into extension is very useful. But you're only going to be doing that if and only if you've cleared everything up top first. And more often than not, if you clear those limitations, then it's usually a non-issue. And that's the progression that I go through when I'm trying to help someone who's got weight-bearing wrist pain with quadruped or push-ups. So to summarize your uh, way you want to go about that. First thing you want to do, make sure they have ribcage positioning. More often than not, some of the weight-bearing issues are because the thorax is migrating forward, and that's putting undue pressure through the wrists. Solution, put them in a position where they can establish lower ribcage position, where they can stack the thorax over the pelvis. Make sure that they're getting multidirectional expansion in the thorax. That can be either with a regressed position, or, hey, push comes to shove, put them in their... Uh, uh, wrist neutral position like fists and that might be able to help them get the thorax position better 
and then they might be able to go back into that wrist extended position. If you're still running into issues, make sure you clear the shoulders, clear the elbow. A lot of times that takes care of the wrist. If they still have a wrist extension limitation after you've taken care of all that stuff, then you might go to your classic wrist extension based stretches. Alex, unbelievable question. The next question comes from my dude, mentee extraordinaire and legend himself, Tristan. And here's what Tristan asks me about. Do you use any other treatment modalities like taping or dry needling? I saw on your website you took a dry needling course a few years ago, but it doesn't seem like you've mentioned it much since then. Since then. The research seems pretty flimsy. I feel like it has to be 90% placebo. But I'm trying to decide if it's just another tool I can use instead of resisting it. Tristan, whew, great question. Man, this is a little bit of a tough one, but we'll see what we can do. So do I use taping? Do I use dry needling? Yes, I use both of them. How often? It's pretty rare. Since I've been back, I couldn't needle in uh, California because it's against the law. Um, so I didn't needle for about... 10 months, 11 months, 12 months. So I got back to Paige in January, and since it's July now, I think I've needled one or two people. So just to give you a litmus in terms of how often I do dry needling, taping, probably a bit more than that, uh, three, four, and five. So I do use these modalities. I think there, there can be use for them, even though the research might not be that great. The problem with a lot of the research in taping and in dry needling is that they're used as standalone treatments. I don't think that any type of manual intervention ought to be a standalone treatment. You ought to complement it with exercise. For me, I'm using a manual technique if the person who I'm working with can't recreate the body position that I'm trying to get them to achieve. For example, in taping, sometimes you might have someone who's got a an externally rotated femur in relation to an internally rotated tibia. And so they have this relative twist about their knee and perhaps a loss of movement options at the hip and, or, or a loss of that normal rotation that should happen at the knee is creating some type of nociceptive input which could be contributing to pain. Maybe they don't know how to put themselves into an orientation where the the, the tibia or the femur is in IR and the tibia is in ER. You could use tape to get them into that position. And I've done that quite a bit with some people who struggle with that. And more often than not, it helps with their pain. At least that's my thought process. That's my intent when I'm doing that. Is that what's actually going on? I don't know. But the evidence is in the outcome. I seem to get consistent outcomes when I see one of those presentations. That could be a, a time which, in which I think tape is justified. If you can apply it, or if you can utilize tape, whether it's kinesio tape or rock tape or whatever tape, or just the, the plain old luco tape, which I really like, um, if you can use it to put the body into orientations that it's not in, place the body in positions it cannot achieve, then maybe it's a worthwhile tool. But that comes with an assessment. And that's what I've found with a lot of seminars that teach either taping or, um, or, or needling is it's not, there, there isn't a worthwhile assessment along with that. More often than not, these are protocols based on pain. And I think that anytime you are using pain as your primary marker for what you're doing treatment wise, it, it, you're probably going to run into some problems because pain is incredibly complex. In people who have persistent pain, the locations can change based on alterations in receptive fields for one thing the immune system is a completely other thing but that's that's you know you want to learn more go to my pain talk at, at uh, zachcoubles.com i'll link the the preview in the show notes but i mean like that's the problem is there's no there's no assessment that there's the the intent or the rationale is not so great when it comes to utilizing these things with dry needling same thing I can utilize a needle to create an eccentric orientation of some muscles that are toned up. Perhaps, and I'll use a, just a hypothetical example, say I can't extend my elbow because I have concentric orientation of the biceps. 
I could justify sticking a needle in there to get that muscle or the tissues, whatever, to relax to allow for full elbow extension. You'd need to follow that up, though, with some type of exercise activity. Or, which has a little bit more research, because I, I get it, Tristan, some of the research is a little bit meh on, on needling, even though if you go to um, Spinal Manipulation Institute's uh, dry needling, which I really like, um, I like that, that group for manual techniques. I'll link them in the show notes. Um, they seem to utilize a lot of different research to support what they're doing. Now, I had someone call me out and say, oh, they bamboozled me with research. But it's like, have they read every single study that's going on with, with dry needling? And like, there's got to be something going on there. It can't be that every study that is done on needling is incorrect and only the placebo studies are are the worthwhile ones. Like that's that's cognitive dissonance to the nth degree. I think you have to weigh both sides. Um, and so back to what I'm saying though, but if we're talking evidence, the um, acupuncture or dry needling with eSIM seems to be more beneficial than it does just straight needles. If I'm using eSIM, that would potentially stimulate or develop a concentric orientation of a muscle group. So Use the same example, I can't extend my elbow. Could you justify sticking needles into the triceps using e-stim to, e to stimulate that muscle to create elbow straightening? It seems like a plausible rationale for me. And the only way you would know it would work is if you retested and you got changes in your outcome measure. And hopefully you're using an outcome measure that translates to something meaningful for the patient. And that's really my stance on those modalities. I think if you have a good rationale for why you're doing it, you're utilizing objective tests to point you in one direction versus the other, then I have zero beef with taping or needling. In fact, my beef level might be vegan. That's the key. There is a lack of intent and rationale when I see these things applied in, uh, with, with, with clinicians. But if you, if, if you can put that into the mix and take into account the evidence along with that, then you're probably going to be in business and you're probably not going to do anything that's offensive to your clientele or that would not be justified based on evidence-based practice. Tristan, great question. If you're like, man, Zach is mentioning this concentric, eccentric orientation stuff, and that's a little bit, you know, funky terminology, but I want to know how to apply some of these concepts so I can improve range of motion. And not only that, but maybe apply it to more strength-based stuff. In fact, I did a podcast with Dr. Ben House and Ryan LeCure uh, last weekend, and it came out today. I'll link it in the show notes. Um, and it's also on my blog, too. But um, we talked about applying some of these concepts that I've been talking about on the Movement Debrief to hypertrophy goals. And uh, I think it's going to be very worthwhile. I taught a human matrix, because that's what I'm leading up to, of course, in Costa Rica this uh, last week, and um, I it was blown away by I have these very high level bodybuilders and people who are pursuing hypertrophy get absolutely crushed with some of the simplest techniques. If you want to learn what those techniques are, then you need to see me at yes, you guessed it, Human Matrix, and it's coming your way quite a few locations. Next week, still got a few tickets left available for August third and fourth in Cincinnati, Ohio. Be there or be square. Even though. Sometimes it's hip to be square. I don't know. Next one after that is August 24th and 25th in Vancouver, British Columbia. The early bird ends this Friday, July 26th at 11.55 p.m. You probably want to be there and sign up for it if you haven't already. September 21st and 22nd in Raleigh, North Carolina. October 5th and 6th in Boston, Massachusetts. November 23rd and 24th in New York City. December 7th and 8th in Orlando, Florida. And I got a 2021 for you. How about that, folks? January 25th and 26th in 2020 in Scotts Valley, California, which if you don't know where that is, that's just outside the Bay Area. I hope to see you at one of them if you want to take your movement goals and your clients' movement capabilities to the next level. But hey, you know, if you don't, hey, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. Maybe you don't want to stay with doing what you do. And, you know, cool. Fam recognized fam. Without further ado, though, the last question. This comes from Giorgio. Or Gio, yeah, Giorgio. I think that's how it's pronounced. And here's what Giorgio asks me. Do you think you may be able 
to put out some sort of content about the realities of being a physiotherapist, or a PT. It may be helpful for many, but I'm very in- interested to hear your thoughts as I'm a strength coach currently battling with the dilemma of becoming a PT. Particularly since I want to go down some of the movement stuff that uh, you talk about and perhaps move away from traditional PT. It would be very helpful to hear about your experience in your profession in comparison to strength conditioning. Giorgio, this is a great question. I'm glad you asked this. Should you become a PT? It depends. Um, it depends on what you feel like your end game is going to be. Where I think a lot of coaches come from who ask me this question is they either want to work in pro sports, which is very tough to get into, and it's tough because of it's a numbers game. I mean, there's, there's just not many positions. And, and you have to um, not only be prepared and have the skill set to contribute, but you also have to know some people to do this. So that's one thing. So first off, it's rare to get it, even though having a PT degree would up your chances. Um, the second thing that I see is they <clears throat> expect to do strength and conditioning. Appreciate you, homegirl. Uh, they expect to do strength and conditioning just with a few other PT tools in the toolbox. Um, and while that can also be very worthwhile, I think that there's definitely some things you can learn through PT curriculum that perhaps may help someone from a fitness perspective. And in fact, when I was getting into PT first and foremost, that was my initial thought that I wanted to do is, man, I wanna, actually both of those things, I wanna work with high level athletes and I love training people, but I can make more money as a PT and I can do skills, maybe like manual therapy and stuff like that, that might be able to help someone progress in fitness that perhaps someone who uh, does not have those skills uh, might, might lag in. And that's really what I envisioned physical therapy was. When I got into PT school, I found out that that wasn't really the case. Well, there's definitely a lot of exercise that I do, a bulk of the population, not all, but a bulk of the population is nowhere near towards the fitness side of things that I was hoping to be in. Um, most of my people, I mean, I have a lot of people who have a hard time walking. And so uh, you're not going to be teaching the the safety squat bar with those people, unfortunately. Um, So really what I think it boils down to is if you should go to PT school or not, is how far along the rehab and training continuum do you want to be able to take someone? Or where do you want to start with people? Because if you're a strength coach, you're most likely going to start with gen pop, some people could be in pain, but they're, hopefully they're post-rehab when you're working with them or you're skilled at working with people in pain. Um, or you have someone who's more higher on the performance end. When you're a physical therapist, you got to kick that back, uh, way back. You are more likely going to be working with a lot of people who are in pain, and that's limiting their ability to do the things they want to do on a daily basis. Maybe they can't walk. Maybe they can't raise their arms overhead. Or maybe they have debilitating pain and they have six other um, medical diagnoses that are just ruining their lives and and, and they can't do much of anything. Maybe walking over 1,000 steps is problematic. So you're starting with a different population. And I think that's really what PT gets you access to, is a different population that is a bit more medically intensive. And that's really what you lack as a strength coach is is that medical background and understanding of things. Um, and and you, you lack, I mean, you do lack the license to potentially help some of those people in the early phases of things. So if you want to work with that population and in order to make ends meet, you're probably going to have to, then you, you, you should go the PT route. Um, but if you're thinking that, well, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing, but I want to add skills to that, it might not be cost effective to do that um, because PT school is expensive as all hell. It is incredibly expensive. I mean, you know, I was, how many years have I been doing this? I graduated in 2011, so that's what, eight years? And I finally paid off my student loans. Like, that's a long time of debt. And I'm still, 
even though I love my job, I still don't have the setup that I want because of something such as debt. Are you willing to potentially go into a lot of debt and eat shit for a while before getting to where you want to go? That's, that's a tough question, and it really depends on how old you are and really where you want to end up. And do you need the, the, the medical background to go where you want to go? And, and I don't know. I mean, for me, I enjoy working with the, the lower-level population or the, the, the population that's in pain. Like, what I envision myself as Zach Couples, you know, at, by the time he's retired, is someone who, if I retire, is someone who can take someone from the lowest lowest level of function or or they, they're in a lot of pain with a lot of other comorbidities and we get them to living the life they want to live in, in, in training. And that in, involves me getting many more skill sets to help people do that, as well as enlisting other practitioners to, to help me carry that mission. And I think having a PT degree has helped set me up into a position to do that. But if you just want a license to touch and you don't, you're not going to be necessarily working with that population or maybe you're working with the post rehab population, which I don't necessarily think you need a PT degree to do. Um, maybe you're better served getting your LMT and just doing that so you can touch people um, and utilize manual therapy in that regard. Because I think that that would save you a bunch of money and it would um, give you a similar skill set, but without the the medical the background and understanding but if that's not your population then who cares you probably don't need it but let's say hey big z i kind of like working with that population i could envision myself helping them should i keep it going sure i would be all for you being a pt um if you do go somewhere cheap i don't think there's two things that i recommend one go somewhere cheap where you're not going to have a bunch of student loans um, because that will really limit your flexibility in terms of what you can do job wise. Because if you got this big old student loan bill that you got to pay every month, you might not be able to take the lower paying gig that is your dream job because of finances. So go somewhere inexpensive. Um, I know that uh, South College, I'll link them in the show notes, they offer an online PT program. Um, and I recommend most people try to check that out because it's also shorter. South College. Also, whatever PT program you go to, make sure you can pick your clinical affiliations. There are lots of good PTs, there's lots of average PTs, and there's few great PTs. You want to try to learn from the absolute best, whoever you decide that that is. Me, I mean, I'm thankful every day that I got the chance to learn from Daddy O Pops Bill Hartman because I was able to set up a clinical affiliation with him. We we spent ten weeks together uh, learning this PT thing, and it's not only helped jumpstart my career into being a good PT, but it's also I've developed a lifelong friendship with this guy and and, and mentorship with him, and uh, that's something that even though I went into a crap ton of debt to do, I have zero regrets about. You need to make sure whatever school you go to has that flexibility because not all will. I've had some of my colleagues who went to PT schools who they they have their clinicals. This is who you can choose from. You can't set up anything on your own. And that sucks because then you're not really directing your learning in a manner that's going to help you be the the clinician that you want to be. So make sure you have those two things when you're going to PT school. And also, if you can get out faster... That's always better. Now, if, if I had unlimited time and funds and I really wanted to help the most people I possibly could, I think having the ultimate license, being an MD, would probably be the way to go, though, if you want to try to utilize a multimodal approach and help someone with as many different skills as possible because they really have way few restrictions, because even I have restrictions. Like, as a, as a PT, you know, one of these days I'm hoping to get down into functional medicine, uh, I can't order blood work, so uh, a doctor can. A doctor could probably do hands-on stuff and be okay. Um, like, if you're really, you know, you got some time and you want to have a huge skill set, go to MD school, or maybe you still want to do the hands-on stuff, you want some training on that, go to DO school. Like, that, I think would give you way more options to help a larger net of people 
and then you you also have more more power and more say. So um, like I think if you had to pick between anything, that would probably be the route that I would go. Um, the reason why I didn't was one, I'm not not that intelligent, right? I'm kind of yeah. I mean, I just I have to learn things over and over again to get them, which is why I started my website. Um, but but also too, it's it's a time and a money thing, and that's just something I can't do now. Um, but if you're young and you really want to have a huge skill set, I would say that's probably the way I would go. Um, so to, to summarize the answer to your question, Giorgio, because it was a great question, should you go to PT school? It depends on who you want to work with. If you want to work with people closer to the persistent pain and lots of medical diagnoses and all that stuff, yeah, I'm all for it. Just make sure you go somewhere cheap and you make sure you can pick your clinicals. If that's not you, just get an LMT so you can put your hands on people. Um, you know, if you're working like post rehab and beyond, that's probably all you would need. It would save you a bunch of money. But I think I think where the meat and potatoes is, if you really want to help someone, I would probably go to MD and DO school um, because I think your skill set is just so much larger, and you have so fewer restrictions. And restrictions allow you to cast a wider net, help a greater amount of people, and use many more different modalities to do so. And I think that's a good stopping point for us tonight. I want to thank all of you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people for tuning in to episode 90. Thanks you so much for doing so. If you want to learn more, you should go to ZachCouples.com. I had mentioned uh, my pain talk in the newsletter. Well, guess what? I got about five hours of talks if you sign up for my newsletter while you're there. You'll get a free acute chronic workload calculator, discounts on future products, weekend goodies every Friday, lots of good stuff. You probably want to sign up for that. I also offer three services on ZachCouples.com. The first a movement consultation. If you're toy and you're not moving as well as you'd like to, or maybe you're a coach or a clinician, and you're kind of beat up because uh, we got to move around a lot, and you're like, I, you know, I'm curious what this Zach guy does, and uh, I want him to help me, but also I want to learn from that experience and be able to apply those concepts to my peeps. A movement consultation is a great way to do that. If you want to take it to the next level, and you're a coach, and you're like, man, this is cool. He's restored my movement options, but I want to see how he does it on the training floor, and I want to get gains or fat loss or I'm post-rehab and I'm unsure where to start, then you want to check me out for my online training program where I take that information from a movement consultation and I design a fitness program tailored to your needs and your goals. Or maybe you just want to learn how to do some of the concepts that I do. Maybe like when I went on that little elbow tire ride, you're like, whoa, I need to learn a little bit more about that. Well, that's where the online mentorship program can come into play, where we will visit with each other one-on-one, and I will have a great dialogue with you about how to do some of the things that I do with your people. And we'll, we'll fit it so it's not like I'm just trying to clone me, but I'm trying to take what I know and help the people that you're working with because I can't work with your people. I don't know your population, but there are some commonalities movement-wise that I think we can share. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, you'll want to go to iTunes and Stitcher, search the Zach Couples Show, because guess what, folks? There are 89 other debriefs. I didn't have the beard for all of them, so maybe, you know, you only want post-beard Zach, you want to do video, and the rest you want to do audio. Definitely go there, and while you're there, please leave a review so we can help the fam grow. On social media, I'm on Facebook, forward slash Z Couples. The Twitter handle is also at Z Couples. I'm on the Instagram, baby. Zach, Z-A-C, Couples, C-U-P-P-L-E-S. And you can find me also on YouTube if you search Zach Couples. If you want to know the up and up in terms of activities that I'm employing with my clientele, my supreme clientele, boom, see what I did there? Ghost face. Then you can go ahead and do that. Um, That's it, though. Thank you so much for tuning in. I want you to keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.